So I'm scrubbing. We'll get dressed and uh, we will be ready to go. So who is uh, connecting today? Is there... We have, we have again uh, from UK, France, Germany, Switzerland, uh, okay. attendees uh, who are interested or slowly learning uh, the whole app. <laughs> uh, so again, uh, if you explain, explain how to start for, for beginners, for, uh, yeah, as, as, as last time. Brilliant, brilliant. We will try to cover all the aspects, not only of the technique. Yeah, and then especially, especially how to use the settings, the right settings uh, of the laser and why. Uh... Yes. Well, my settings, maybe you can show the settings. Typically, I use 100 watts and 2 joules, 50 hertz. And I use the virtual basket setting because it's uh, excellent for dissection and coagulation. And then we lower the power a little bit uh, using 1.2 joules and 40 hertz and the bubble plus setting for coagulation. So this is a setting, setting wise, but as you will see, and I will try, I will try to explain, there's not only, not only the settings are important, because uh, the settings are is telling you how the laser is coming out of the fiber. You know, these are the settings. But then of course, the person manipulating the fiber is a surgeon. So let's do the white balance, the most para white balance. So I've already done. So, you know, with the same settings, two different surgeons can have slightly different results. Okay, so we will change to the endoscopic image, Santi. Because we're going to start and have a look inside. Okay, see what's going on in here. The initial part of the urethra is uh, a little bit resistant to the scope, so I will. You want gel here? Let's put some more gel. It looks a good uh, caliber, but for some reason I'm having trouble to enter. And I don't want to force, of course. There we are, okay. So this gentleman uh, has uh, lower urinary tract symptoms since uh, 2014. He has had several episodes of retention and also a high PSA with two negative biopsies. Um, he has a 90, 90 gram prostate, as you can see, relatively bulky, bulky prostate. And uh, we did an MRI recently that was uh, normal. So probably it's just an inflammatory uh, high PSA. His PSA was 10. So I'm going to, uh, settings. I'm going to start uh, putting the fiber inside. And as I said, the settings are not the only determinant of uh, tissue effects. You see that the camera is a little bit out of focus. Do you see the endoscopic image? Yes, perfectly. Ah, oh, brilliant. Yep. So, uh, I'm going to show the unblock technique and I uh, will start at the apex. So it's important to come out like this, you see, and recognize where is the limit of the sphincter with the, with the adenoma. You can see this line here. So I will start by marking this line uh, with the laser. The patient is coughing a little bit, so I will. These are movements from, from the patient. We are doing a spinal anesthesia. So sometimes we have this lack of collaboration with the with the patients. But here I'm marking the, the white line. You see it's the trying to determine where's the limit you see between the sphincter and the apex of the prostate. Sometimes this comes very much below the veromontanum. You see that we have to go lower uh, because it's common knowledge or common, let's say dogma, no? that if you're going to do a resection, you shouldn't go below the veru. But here, of course, we have to look for the anatomical plane. And then I'm going to try to enter the plane and for that, I'm going to go to the floor of the veromontanum to, to, to start developing the plane on this side. This is the, the right side of the patient. And as I said, 
and I will elaborate more. And I think we can discuss on the other practical uh, issues later on between patients, if that's okay with you. Uh, so here I'm going to focus more on, on technique while we do the operation. Okay, so here I'm going to enter as well to look for the proper plane. Uh, you see that I'm going to the floor of the Vero Montanum. This is Veru, so I'm coming down here. Often I like to come all the way to the to the white line and release also these fibers here because that will reduce the amount of traction that the apex is going to receive no, from, from the dissection. So the idea is that uh, this technique uh, consists of a series of steps that are designed to allow for a tension-free release of the sphincter early in the operation, you know, not immediately, but early. And that will uh, provide excellent clinical results. Uh, we don't worry anymore about post-operative stress incontinence. We don't tell the patients to do Kegel exercises. We tell them it's quite unlikely that they will have incontinence post-operatively because the rate of post-operative stress incontinence is uh, lower than 1.5%. So it's, it's very, very low. So here you see that now I'm cutting the frenulum of the Vero Montanum. So I'm connecting the two spaces that I created at the beginning of the operation. Now we are developing the posterior line. Okay, here it looks a little bit flimsy. So I'm going to point my laser a little bit upwards and away from, from that very, very thin look of, of the capsule. So the idea and the way this operation works is uh, mainly following the lines, you know, that we're going to develop. This is the posterior line, you know, I'm following the posterior line. So I try to position my scope so that the line is in the middle. You see, so I can see a little bit of capsule and a little bit of adenoma on both sides of the line. And then I'm going to uh, try to do dissection movements very carefully, moving from side to side and trying to do very wide, very wide movements. You know, I don't want to go deep for example, here and continue here and do short movements because this is going to create an irregular line of dissection. I'd rather go like this and, you know, follow, 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 follow through. You know, I try to position the scope so I can have a look at the capsule and the adenoma at the same time. And we have lost this endoscopic view. Han perdido la visión endoscopica. They're trying to correct. Está pasando? Sorry for that. We're checking what's going on. Still black. Black with NDI. Mentioned the. Let's see if they can switch. And now it's good. Now, now it's good. Okay. It. Yeah. So we take it from uh, the same point where we left it. Okay. This is the posterior line we are developing. Okay. And I will develop this line. Uh, and as I said, you see, if you work, for example, too far. There's no effect. If you get slightly closer, there will be some coagulation effect, but there's hardly any dissection, you see? If you get even closer, then you start seeing that the energy is disrupting the fibers that connect uh, the capsule and the adenoma. So working distance is paramount. The second factor, as I said, is, is the speed of movement. I can choose to have a very slow, like this, we see very slow movement. And that will give me very good hemostasis, you see, or I could go a little bit faster. And of course, that will give me faster dissection, but maybe uh, hemostasis might be compromised if you go very fast. And then, of course, uh, if this is the line of, of dissection, you see, we can fire against the line like this. You see, we could fire outside of the line, like in, in the capsular edge, you see. And that, of course, uh, is dangerous because we get deeper in the tissue. And then, of course, as the angles uh, are changing, you know, between the capsule and the adenoma, the, the, the aiming of the laser is, is super paramount, is super important. So here I'm, I'm trying to develop the posterior line. I have to say that sometimes we see a beautiful plane. We see a beautiful plane. 
but very often we don't see it, huh? the beautiful plane. And you know, with these new energies and uh, like with uh, virtual baskets, you know, the double bubble uh, setting, often the tissue is a little bit uh, coagulated, you know, the hemostasis improved. But then sometimes the visualization of the beautiful plane is not so, not so easy. You see, if I do a little bit of mechanical dissection, you can start seeing this plane. You see, it's uh, recognizable. Often, often we see that uh, it's very beautiful. Here, by the way, there is a nodule. You can see there is a small nodule. I'm going to try to take it out. You see, this is an adenomatous nodule. So I'm going to try to dissect it off, off the capsule. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, you have to recognize the capsule and you have to recognize the interface between the adenoma and the capsule, not just by this beautiful look of the interface between adenoma and capsule, you know, that we see sometimes. It's frustrating to try to see that all the time because it's not always there, you know, it's not always there uh, everywhere around the prostate. So sometimes you have a very nice plane anteriorly and a very bad plane posteriorly. So we have to start recognizing the capsule because of other factors. For example, one is the smoothness of the, of the, of the capsule. You know, the capsule is quite smooth. You can tell, you see, the fibrosity of the capsule. Uh, you have to start distinguishing the capsule because there are fibers, you see, in the surface. Uh, also the color, uh, I would say the, the adenoma is quite uh, more yellow and the capsule is more white. So with these factors in mind, we can, we can progress in our operation. Okay, so now that I did some of the posterior liberation, I'm going to come to the apex. You see here, here I see my white line. The, the, this is the sphincter. And I'm going to, as the first step, I'm going to deepen the, the white line. Okay, so here you see I'm deepening the white line a little bit because I want better access. This is, these are also called access lines. Huh? So here, I'm going to try to start developing the lateral aspects. You know, this is the posterior. This is the lateral. And I will be very, very careful at the beginning not to push up too much, just some millimeters, four, five, six millimeters like this. And I will take this dissection deeper towards the bladder neck. The idea is to try to reach, <coughs> let's say, probably a similar uh, depth as we did posteriorly. This is the phase that I like to call uh, mobilize, mobilization uh, phase and connection because so mobilize and connect. So here, what I'm trying to do is to mobilize the apex a little bit, initially posterior laterally. And also I want to connect with the line of dissection that we had posteriorly. Because these lines of dissection, if you think about them, and I, I want you to picture in your mind a transverse section of an MRI of the prostate, you know? If you, if you picture that in your mind, you're going to perfectly recognize. You see, I'm seeing some BPH tissue here. That's why I'm going a little bit deeper, trying to find out. And also this looks like maybe there is some BPH tissue there. Huh? So sometimes you have to re-question or re-challenge your planes, you know, and if you think that there could be BPH tissue, you have to deepen a little bit more. So, you know, that's how we drive the operation. We try to have a line that we can recognize. You see, all of this looks like somewhat, you know, yellow and somewhat, uh, how do you say, the aspect of, of, of adenoma, no? Anyway, what we try to, to, to get these lines, okay, that we can follow because once you have entered in a depth that is compatible with the plane, you know, the right plane, following that depth is not so difficult by looking at the characteristics of the tissue. Here, uh, this is quite, you know, this, this guy had biopsies, had a high PSA, so probably there's some inflammatory <coughs> changes there. Okay, we'll, we'll get back to that, to that situation there. But here we are at the apex. I'm trying to coagulate this uh, little bleeder apically here. This is the white line. And I'm trying to follow this, this white line. You see now more horizontally, trying to get towards 12 o'clock to get some access again. And then to, to try to continue 
with the liberation of the lateral aspect. Okay, this is the careful approach towards the anterior part. We have dissected initially a little bit of the lateral aspect. Then we came out again to try to check that the apical attachments, you see, this is an apical attachment. This is a sphincter. The apical attachments are not limiting me. Okay, so if I can come up here, which would be probably in the clock around 11 o'clock, then I can come towards 11 o'clock as I go deeper towards the bladder neck. Okay, I don't want to have, uh, and that was the problem with the original technique. You know, people would get under the adenoma and come up all the way without looking back, without looking at the sphincter, and that would damage the sphincter. And that would cause uh, stress incontinence postoperatively, you know, because the classic technique, the three-lobe technique, was very careless about what is going on on the, at the apex as you dissect the plane. So here, what I'm trying to do is to be careful as I dissect the apex, you know, by releasing the apical attachments first, and then trying to mobilize the apex. You see that, for example. Here, you know, if we want to come up, there is a very nice space because we have mobilized the apex. And then when I want to come towards 12 o'clock and here's, here's the 12 o'clock mark that we mark at the beginning, we have some space and we have some orientation because we mobilize the apex. Let's repeat these steps uh, starting again here. This is my white line on the other side. So initially I'm going to deepen the incision a little bit. This is an access incision. So people tell me, oh, you're cutting on the adenoma. Well, I don't mind because, you know, I can make a small cut, but then I'm going to look for the good plane here. So again, two, three, four, five, six millimeters up to enter the lateral plane, you see? And again, I'm going to do the mobilize and connect uh, movements, mobilization of the apex and try to connect with the line that we had performed uh, posteriorly. Here we are coming up a little bit. You see this mobilization is paramount if we want to, if we want to get towards the 12 o'clock area. But you see here, I'm stopping. I'm not going further up because when I come out, you see this is still attached. This is the apical attachment. So I want to cut the apical attachment first. I will do another access incision, this time a little bit more horizontal like this. And then, you know, this takes me to the proper plane and I can start and I can continue to dissect the plane. You see here, again, I take another five, six, seven millimeters upwards and then towards the bladder neck. This is the progressive mobilization of the apex that is going to allow me to tackle the, the 12 o'clock area very safely and very consistently. Okay. So you see here, I'm coming up, but still I'm not forcing my way up. I'm just trying to carry a nice line that then I can follow, you see? The line of dissection is coming downwards like this, and it has to connect with the posterior line. This is the posterior line that we marked before. This way we are oriented. We have entered the right depth for dissection, and then, in order to carry this dissection towards the bladder neck, we just have to judge if the depth of the dissection that we are taking is, is good enough. Here again, you see, I have some attachment. So I come out uh, towards the apex and then I try to cut the apical attachments first. You see, trying to progressively approach the 12 o'clock region. Here, you see. So very carefully trying to avoid traction on the sphincter area. And now you'll see the magic uh, taking place. Here I'm trying to, you see, follow my line. This is lateral line, and this is now becoming anterior line. So here I also want to connect properly to the anterior line, lateral line coming downwards, coming downwards. Okay, so at the end of this apical liberation, we should have a very clear line that goes all around the adenoma. So what happens if we come here towards 12 o'clock? Look, we have developed this liberation here. You see, this is the plane 
on the other side, and this is the plane now on this side. So we just have our 12 o'clock mark here. And now we know that we have to catch the 12 o'clock tissue to connect these two planes. It's similar to what we did when we developed uh, near the Veru, one plane first, then the other side, and then we cut the frenulum of the Veru to connect. Huh? So here again, we're doing the same thing, connecting these two spaces, you see, perfectly under control, perfectly knowing where we are, perfectly oriented. And now I will try to construct the anterior line. The anterior line sometimes needs some more, more work. You have to judge if the depth uh, that you are taking is good enough or not. Sometimes there is a risk of leaving some adenomatous tissue in this area at 12 o'clock. So I don't want to leave tissue, of course, and I want to try to, you see, work on the anterior line, uh, trying to work on the anterior line, follow the arc, you think on the MRI image, and if you look at an MRI of a big prostate, you will see how the line is quite uniform. And we have it in our mind already, you know, so we know the anatomy of, of the capsule, we know how it goes. And here, you see what I'm trying to concentrate on is on these parameters I told you, I have my settings, but I want to do a nice dissection and at the same time, try to carry a nice hemostasis. If I rush it too much, if I run too much, what's going to happen is that I will dissect the plane very beautifully, but the quality of hemostasis will be a little bit less. So I have to look at a nice tempo, you know, a movement that gives enough time to the energy to, 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 to provide a nice coagulation. And then I have to check always, and I have to connect the lines always so that we have a nice orientation all the time. Here you see that we have now the lateral dissection line coming down. And here, what we have to, to decide is if we fire against the line, this maybe looks a little bit deep. So maybe you would decide to go a little bit towards the adenoma, you see? to try to stay inside. The idea is that we might cause a small perforation. You see the, the, the speed I'm moving and the distance I'm using and the tissue effect I am getting is quite soft. It's not very aggressive. So if I develop the plane with such uh, care, you know, in every point, I just do a little bit of dissection. And that means that it's very rare that I'm going to cause a major perforation. And if I see that the capsule is thinning in some region, it's very easy for me to correct the aiming. I fire a little bit more inside. You know what I mean? So in this phase of the operation, that the idea is that the sphincter has been released completely. And if we come out, you will see here, the sphincter's mucosa, there is some small bleeder, but the sphincter has been preserved <laughs> exactly up to the line that we marked. And now we just have to go around the adenoma, around the adenoma. You see, we can go all the way around, all the way around in both sides. And, you know, it's very simple. And then when you have a line of dissection, you have to judge the characteristics of the plane. If it looks a little bit deep, we will fire closer to the adenoma. If it looks uh, that we are leaving yellow tissue, we will fire a little bit outside so that we can take the tissue with us, no? with, the, with the bulk of the prostate that we are dissecting. So here you see also one of the details I, I will, I like is you see that my fiber is very static. One of the problems with uh, uh, understanding the anatomy of Holeb is that sometimes surgeons are moving around the camera, the fiber, you know, they have the theory that if you are at this position in this part of the prostate, maybe the angle of incidence is better to do the dissection. But to me, this is like an Olympic shooter. You know, the Olympic shooter fires with the gun uh, at 12 o'clock, you know? He doesn't fire like in the, I don't know, the New York gangs that uh, fire with the pistol uh, sideways. You know what I mean? So to me, keeping the fiber still gives me a lot of control and I can decide if I fire against the line inside of the line, outside of the line, and it gives me a lot of control. And also it's not confusing at all because I don't have to switch, rotate the camera. I don't have to rotate the fiber. So 
my advice to people who are learning is try to keep the fiber in your fingers. I'm holding the fiber with my fingers. And you see, try to move around the adenoma following your line. And it's a simple judgment, you know, am I in the right plane? Am I losing the plane? Am I going too deep? And then modify your strategy accordingly. You know, it's not so difficult. It's not rocket science. And of course, I think once you see this kind of behavior, it's quite uh, easy to reproduce. Uh, I teach a lot of people and I have to say, once they get familiar with this concepts, you know, when they get aware that, you know, the way you, you handle the laser fiber and not only the settings, because if you think the settings are going to define the, the, the tissue effect, you will not understand what's going on, you know? You, you will say, why did I perforate here? What did I cut too deep, you know? Of course, your working distance was not correct. You know, you got too close to the tissue, the energy was too disruptive. So you have to reflect on these things to, in order to understand and in order to be able to do a nice uh, operation and a safe operation. So here you see, I'm following my line of dissection. Of course, I'm trying to understand uh, and I, I, I really trust my line of dissection because as I said, once you are in these depths, uh, it's not very difficult and especially with holmium because now of course there's other lasers in the market, you know, tulium, pulse tulium lasers, uh, tulium fiber lasers. They cut really well. They pr provide very good hemostasis but they do not have the dissection effects that the holmium laser uh, offers. And you will ask yourselves, how is that possible? Why holmium dissects the plane and why tulium and tulium fiber do, does not dissect the plane so much or so. So the, the example uh, to understand this effect is that holmium, you know, the wavelengths are very similar, two microns for tulium, two microns and uh, 140 nanometers for, so 2,140 nanometers for holmium. You know, it's very similar. So the tissue effects and the interaction with water is very similar as well. The thing is that holmium can emit pulses that are high energy pulses in a very short time. So short pulses and very powerful pulses. And this, uh, this uh, characteristic is, called, well, the, the, the holmium laser can emit with very high peak power, you know? And the peak power is uh, the amount of instantaneous energy coming out of the fiber. And uh, it is much higher than what tulium or tulium fiber can offer. So basically when this energy comes out of the fiber, it's going to find uh, the water. As it has affinity for water, it's going to hit it very fast. So, you know, close to the fiber, there will be a sudden the position of energy that will cause an increase in temperature in the water, you know, very, very abrupt to the point that we might have this uh, super hot water, you know, water that uh, is over uh, 100 degrees. And then of course, this water has to transition very fast to, 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 to vapor. Huh? And that generates this bubble that we see on the, on the videos. From, from companies and this bubble is like, uh, you can picture it like, a, like an explosion. Here, for example, we have a nice example. You see that the capsule is looking thinner here. So I don't want to fire against this. I want to fire closer to the anoma. You see, I'm correcting my plane so that it, it doesn't go very, very deep. So as I said, uh, this, this little explosion that happens on the tip of the fiber is going to uh, cause some uh, pressure wave, a pressure wave, a uh, shock wave that is going to uh, help dissect the, the surgical plane following the path of, of least resistance. Of course, it's easier for the bubble and the expansion to follow the right plane than to penetrate the capsule or to penetrate the anoma, you know? So that's why the behavior, and, and I picture as if I had two little scissors on the point of my fiber, and every time I, I fire against the interface between anoma and capsule, what I'm achieving 
is uh, like the effect of the scissor blades spreading, you know, so some expansion of, of the space and some dissection of the plane. When you use tulium or tulium fiber lasers, you know, the pulses they do are not reaching this very high peak power. So holmium has peak powers of around 10,000 watts uh, and over. And tulium, I think, in the markets uh, are reaching 3,000, 5,000 tops. So the effect of a tulium laser dissecting the plane is going to be a little bit more like using a knife to develop the plane. Of course, you can develop the plane with a knife. If you try to think about peeling an orange, huh? we peel the oranges with a knife, of course, but uh, many times what happens is some of the uh, yellow stuff from the orange skin remains, uh, you know, and, and some meat remains on the skin. You know what I mean? So the idea is that holmium pulses allow you, help you to find the right plane due to this uh, explosive effect, whereas tulium has very good cutting properties. Okay, so here, as you see, we're going around the prostate. Uh, it's a big one. It's, uh, well, 90, 90 grams, not, a, not huge, but uh, still it's giving us some work. And now I'm trying to follow my line. You see, I can follow my line. I'm trying to connect. You see, always uh, try to connect your line, try to go from your line in one place. And if there is some discrepancy or if there is something that uh, the line is degrading a little bit, you need to look after the line because the line will help you a lot. And uh, in, in, the, in the areas where, you know, it's difficult to see the beautiful plane, it helps you a lot to realize that you are more or less in the right uh, depth of, of the dissection. Of course, you have to analyze the tissue you see all the time and you have to judge. For example, down here, you see we had some yellow tissue. Remember at the beginning? So here, for example, it looks as if I was probably not aware that there could be some more uh, tissue here. Let me try. And you see that we can deepen quite safely. I hope I can show you. You see this, uh, this tissue that we see here is a little bit yellow in color and I'm deepening my dissection a little bit more to check. Huh? This is, of course, at the beginning, you, you're happy if you can remove the anoma. Maybe you don't see these uh, subtle changes in the capsule, but as you get more experienced, you start seeing that maybe you're leaving some tissue behind. Let's see if I can develop a line. Also, as, as we said, this patient had a high PSA, several biopsies. So sometimes, you know, the inflammatory changes or, but you see, when I see yellow tissue, I want to go deeper and find out. And very often, most often, I would say, I find that there is BPH tissue there that should be removed even when, you know, sometimes this uh, BPH grows uh, in a nodular fashion and, uh, and uh, some of these nodules can, so instead of uh, thinking of a billiard ball, you see, we think of a, a fruit, no, it's not always perfect. And we have to judge. Of course, this plane looks very flimsy. You see, it looks very, very thin. So I have to be careful and I have to uh, target my laser properly so I don't target it against the capsule, but closer to the, to the edge of the adenoma so the energy doesn't deepen you know, the, the dissection too much. Here, for example, it looks flimsy. I don't know if you can see the detail. I hope you can. But I'm taking a little bit more time in the dissection of this lower plane because I think there is some tissue worth uh, removing here. Maybe a nodule, maybe some... Sometimes this plane could be obliterated by inflammation, by a tumor, by, you know, maybe the scarring effect of multiple biases. I'm trying to use the energy very softly, very carefully, so I don't deepen too much. You know, sometimes it's not easy because you are already working near a very thin plane, but 
I think this is a noma, so we should we should take it out. So very carefully, I'm going to. You see, we have advanced more uh, rapidly in the rest of the the conference, but here I'm trying to go a little bit slower and very careful not to deepen too much my dissection. So there we are, slowly getting better, slowly getting, you see, I always protect the line because the line is your savior. You know, if you, if you carry a nice line that you can follow, I think it's uh, safer, you know, it's much safer and you have a reference and I trust my lines a lot. You know, things uh, that maybe what I'm telling you looks a little bit abstract for you when I talk about the lines, but you know, when you have to do this operation a lot, you, the lines become your friends, you know, and uh, you talk to them and you communicate with them and you look after them. So you become a little bit crazy. And uh, everything comes, uh, becomes a little bit philosophical. Okay, so here you see we are looking at the circular fibers of the bladder neck. Below this, we have the vertical fibers of the bladder neck. So I'm going to deepen. Now I'm going to cut these vertical fibers because I know that the bladder is behind. Huh? This is the anterior commissure here. We're cutting uh, the bladder neck now. What we see here is probably muscle fibers, submucosa, mucosa of the bladder you see here. And now I'm trying to follow the curvature of the fibers of the bladder neck to try to uh, continue with the dissection. Here we are, here we are. And I'm going to do the same on the other side. So you see, if you reflect about it, when we started, we started at the apex posteriorly. We entered in one side, we developed the other side, we connected in the middle. Then we tried kind of did something similar to get uh, towards the anterior parts. So to liberate the sphincter. So we went from one side, then we went from the other side and then we connected in the middle. And if we started posteriorly at the apex here, we are starting anteriorly. Huh? So the bladder neck, we enter anteriorly. And you see now we have managed to open the bladder neck. So now my, uh, let's say next uh, step, See, this could be a little bit of adenoma too here, you see on this side. So not only that side, but a little bit here. And if this happens, of course, you want to take it out. You don't want to leave adenomatous nodules that could grow in the future. Huh? The philosophy of Holep is to try to be definitive, to try to be aggressive. And if you master the use of the energy properly, it's quite safe to do so, huh? the safe operation. Okay. So here you see, I'm coming from the side, I'm reaching near the bladder neck here, I hope. Where are you? Well, there's still some way to go. So let's continue with the lateral and posterior dissection. See if this dissection following my line of dissection will take me towards the bladder neck opening that we just did. So here also I am very, very careful <laughs> looking at the characteristics of the tissue. But so far, so good. I'm following my line of dissection. You see, I do wide dissection movements. I don't deepen just in one area. I try to go, and here, you see, here we are reaching the bladder neck again. So we are now starting to cut the bladder neck in the posterior aspect. We did the anterior, now we do the posterior. There's a moment here when you can, you know, enter the bladder and check where is the UO. So here I'm going to enter and check. You see that looks like the bar. This is the UO. So we're not so far and we have to be careful with that. But you see now I can go from the lateral aspect all the way to enter the bladder neck here. So let's go to the other side. And we will do, we will try to do the same. Here we still have to do some dissection 
down here you see that the plane is a little bit sticky let's see if i can finish this so we can continue and again this is my line of dissection i'm using the energy very softly so that i don't deepen too much and if i deepen a little bit i can correct and of course a little bit is not dangerous dangerous is we can when you do a big opening or a deep opening but if you do a let's say superficial indentation in the capsule it's not going to have any any consequence huh? here this is the posterior line connecting to the lateral line getting closer towards the bladder neck trying to follow my line okay so always connecting here i'm trying to connect with the posterior line let's see where we are here you see this is the posterior line <coughs> here it's very beautiful and i can even continue towards the other side maybe you see when we have these beautiful long lines it's a pleasure to 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 do a nucleation carefully here let's see it looks slightly deep there so when when i find that uh, that i'm getting deep of course i have to correct my aiming i have to point towards the adenoma huh? in the side of the adenoma following my line but aiming closer to the adenoma because you see most of the energy is absorbed by the adenoma and i managed to separate adenoma and capsule without deepening the capsule so this is i think the most important single thing that you have to know aiming is fundamental you know if we are here and you fire here you will perforate the capsule but if you fire up here you see you will develop the plane very simple concept very easy to learn and very easy to execute you see this is the posterior line that we are developing but of course i wanted to my original intention was to come here and try to connect with the bladder neck you see here we still have to detach a little bit but you see one of the advantages of the in block technique is that we had an excellent view during the operation you see that we didn't have to do cuts at the beginning most of the time until we open the bladder the irrigation of this space uh, is uh, very very good because there is no passage of irrigation fluid to the bladder you know we are just irrigating the space between prostate uh, sorry adenoma and capsule and uh, that gives you excellent visibility when when you open uh, the connection to the bladder of course if there is some bleeding you know the blood will enter the bladder and then it will be more difficult to wash uh, the bleeding huh? so here i'm trying to find out how this curve is 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 taking place coming from the uh, posterior plane towards the bladder neck in this region so here we will make small improvements a small uh, dissection you know you have to win the little battles if you want to win the war let's go to the other side when something gets a little bit more difficult you see that the prostate's getting very mobile now so even maybe i could uh, lift it a little bit not yet i think but i will try to get under and see if i can uh, finalize or improve the dissection in this side you see here we will get towards the bladder neck this is posterior here coming up always correcting the aiming of the laser so that it doesn't go against the capsule it goes against the adenoma on top and the procedure is nearly finished now huh? we just have to continue dissecting the posterior aspect here let's see if we can see the bladder there you see this is the bladder we had the uo very close so we will be careful there I will go in again to check the position of the UO before I cut this. If I can, let's see if I can go in. Yes. We saw the UO here, here, and ah, sorry, I got upwards. Let's, I have to go from below if I want to be super safe. Let me advance this a little bit more. 
before we catch the access to the bladder. Of course, uh, as the prostates get uh, bulkier, you know, sometimes this is the edge I want to cut. And let's see if I can see where the UO is here nearby. It is there, you see, that's the edge of my dissection. So we are now quite uh, certain that we are not uh, damaging the UO. Let's see. Well, all the time you spend uh, watching the UO and uh, let, you know, knowing where it is, it's, it's a well-spent time. There it is. Huh? So now you see we are more medial than the UO. Let's go to the other side and see if we can do a similar thing. So you see the approach here. I did some movement, I think, and I went slightly uh, deep in the capsule. So let's see if I can correct here and detach this. Sometimes, you know, the, the prostate uh, capsule is so thin in these areas that even with mechanical movements, if you're not very careful, you can sometimes uh, get somewhat deep in the capsule. But of course, we haven't spoken about the attitude you have to have for polyp. And I think it's almost as important as the technical aspects. You have to be very relaxed, you know, when you do polyp. And you have to be very technical, you see, not, not emotional, but technical. And if you see a, a deepening in the capsule, a perforation, something like that, you shouldn't panic. But let's see now, because I think the prostate is very mobile here. I'm going to try to lift it a little bit and see if I can push it into the bladder carefully. Yeah. So you see, this side has rotated. I don't know if you can see that. This is prostatic urethra, and this is bladder neck. So now half of the prostate is inside the bladder. Now, when we come down here, to check how things are looking, we have a much better idea. You see, we understand much better now because there is more space and we can continue with our dissection, cutting the attachments that remain. And many people tell me why, uh, I mean, probably the prostate is so big that you cannot push it in the bladder. And I have to say that the trick to push the, the prostate and block uh, to the bladder is to try to uh, rotate the, the adenoma. You see, we have rotated uh, this, this side. Now I'm going to continue the rotation in the same sense. So I'm going to push very carefully, trying to tilt the, the prostate completely. And I think I managed already. And here's the last attachment you see. Let's see where the UO is in this side here. So not so far, but I will try to, you know, complete the enucleation. You see, one of the important things with HOLEP is to watch many cases because there is a simple, there are some simple principles that you can follow to do HOLEP. But of course, then the anatomic variations, you know, the difficult cases, the, the patients make uh, this uh, application of these principles to look a little bit different from case to case. So if, if you watch a very difficult case, you might think, wow, polyp is so difficult. But then you watch an easy case and you think, wow, you might think, you know, you might have a wrong idea about the difficulty of performing polyp. But when you see many cases uh, and you recognize the basic principles of polyp, you know, you, uh, you can understand better that there are easy cases and uh, difficult cases, but as long as you stick to the surgical principles, the UO is here. You see that? It's quite close to where we are working. So as long as you adhere to these uh, surgical principles, everything is going to be okay. So regarding the attitude, as I said, you have to be very relaxed. You see, sometimes in some areas, you're going to find that the plane looks a little bit deep. Sometimes this could cause some, you know, extravasation of water locally. 
usually of, of no concern. Here, this is a bigger perforation, I think. I, and I did this mechanically, not, not with the laser, maybe in one of my, my movements. But again, I remain quiet. I remain uh, calm. You know, I try to do hemostasis. Maybe in this case, I'll probably leave the catheter a little bit longer. Huh? Typically, we are quite aggressive removing catheters, but maybe in this case, it went slightly deeper there. So let's check the UO one last time. Here, this is good. If we go to the other side. Where are you? We saw it here. Okay. So let's check the final hemostasis. Especially, it's important to check near the bladder neck. Because this explosive nature of Holep is a disadvantage here. You see, when you cut the mucosa, it's an explosive cutting uh, property, you know? So sometimes there's disruption of these vessels and there's a tendency to bleed from the mucosal edge. So I spend a little bit of time trying to, to morselate, sorry, trying to, to coagulate these vessels. Here there's some near the mucosa, but of course we are very close to the UO. So we have to check where we are and very carefully uh, try to, sorry, control these bleeders without interfering with, there we are. Okay, so I'm going to try to morselate. Of course, uh, with a perforation, I will keep my bags relatively low. They are not so high. I'm No. Al final, a lo mejor. Okay. So I'm going to do the change of instruments. Okay. So another aspect that is paramount is that you cannot do HOLEP alone. So you need to have a good team that supports you. You know, here I'm changing the instruments. I'm, and in order to do these things fast, you have to rehearse them, you know, these this movements and this, you have to do some rehearsal and you have to have a good team that supports you. Often during morselation, you might find that uh, there is some issue the morselator gets obstructed. It's not efficient. You know, the suction is not good. There's some, you know, uh, leak of vacuum in the system. So the morselator cannot attract the adenoma uh, enough to, to pro provide a good morselation. So it's important to have a good team. Huh? Uh, this is probably one of the most important factors of uh, HOLEP, having a good team, understanding, uh, as I said, tissue effects, you know, laser tissue interaction, and how to use the laser, uh, the fiber properly. The settings uh, are important, but to a certain point, because two surgeons with same settings will produce different tissue effects. One surgeon could be very, very safe. Um, another surgeon could be very reckless, you know, and uh, if, if he doesn't understand how tissue laser interaction works. With morselation, my advice is to get the best morselator you can, because if you have a slow morselator, typically, you know, the morselation process does not irrigate very well. You know, you are putting water in the bladder, you're sucking water out of the bladder, but it doesn't clean the, the view uh, the same way as a continuous uh, irrigation endoscope because, because uh, there's not so much water coming out and not so much water coming in. Many people use two irrigation sets, you know, four bags, using both entries in the uh, nephroscope, I use only one usually. I use only one because I think it's simpler, but I have a lot of attention. I pay a lot of attention to the quality of morselation because when morselation is good as it is, as it is now, 
you will see that most of the time the mouth of the blade is closed by the tissue, you know, it's obliterated by the tissue. So there's going to be some water coming out, but not too much. And there's going to be a lot of tissue coming out. Only when morselation is not efficient, uh, when you see that, you see the mouth of the morselator a lot, and you keep sucking, sucking water, you know, then there is danger of emptying the bladder and uh, cause uh, trouble. So for morselation, you have to do, to guarantee that you have a good, good hemostasis. And this laser is amazing in that respect because we usually have very good visibility. You must make sure that your team is helping you because you have your eyes uh, totally, you know, stuck in the screen. You cannot look at the water unless you stop for a moment to look, you know, to check if there's water coming in. And uh, you have to rely on your team. They, they have to help you. They have to let you know that there's water enough and they have to be responsible. They have to be present in the operation. This is what I tell them, you know, you don't have to be present in the operating room. You have to be present in the operation. It's very different. Huh? So if, if you visit me sometime and you're welcome to, to visit me whenever you want, uh, you will see that our team is looking at the screen. Everybody is looking at what's going on because it's a team effort. It's not a surgeon effort. So they will uh, help me so I can relax. I don't have to control everything that goes on in the operating room. They control their own roles and I can relax and concentrate on what I am doing. Of course, you want to have good visibility Another advice is don't work like this. You see, if you work with, with the blade too close to the lens, you will not have any perspective of where you are. If you take the uh, morselator a little bit more inside, you can see that the upper half of the screen is occupied by tissue. The lower half is uh, occupied by the blade, but in both sides of the blade, you can see two black triangles. And these triangles are showing you that the blade is far away from the bladder because they are black. You know, now we see that the color is black. And that means that we're not close to the bladder. If we get closer to the bladder, you see, we start seeing other colors, pink, red. Huh? So these black triangles give you the, the peace of mind that you're not anywhere close to the bladder. Of course, if you have a fast morselator like this uh, Piranha morselator, then you will uh, progress very fast and the morselation period will be uh, very limited. We usually average 10 grams per minute of uh, tissue. So typically for a 90 gram adenoma, it would take us nine or 10 minutes to take the tissue out, which is much faster than the original morselation speed, you know, that could be double or triple that, uh, that time. Fernando, may I ask you a question? It go ahead, go ahead. How does the morselator works when you have uh, stones inside the prostate? Well, uh, if, if there is a lot of stones, you might get into trouble because the stones can damage the edges of, of the morselator jaws and they could obstruct the motor or the system. So in a very stony prostate, it might be a problem. But I have to say these situations are quite rare. Often we see little stones, but uh, mostly, you know, when there are stones between the anoma and the capsule, these are going to be, let's say, floating in the, or, or in the, in the fossa or in the bladder floor, you know? So it's not a very common problem, I would say. Occasionally, you have to be aware that this can happen. And if you see a stone, instead of trying to morselate the stone, you should try to go to another you know, area of, of the morselation of the tissue. Yeah. No? OK, thanks. But uh, well, now we will have the time between patients. We have time to, to, to have questions and answers, I think. It was interesting to try to reflect on the different uh, technical aspects.
but now morselation is uh, nearly finished. You see, we have a very nice fossa with good hemostasis. I'm going to try to do an ultrasound. Let's see if we can check with my ultrasound the quality of the job. So I'm going to take the oscillator out. Now we have to switch to the iPad camera. Se puede cambiar la cámara del iPad. Y con el iPad tenéis que filmar la. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick the ultrasound. El, no se ve nada. Tenéis que cambiar los, los settings. No, eso es muy pequeño. No, no. Dale, Moisés, pon la fotografía, por favor. Ok. So now you can see, you see, this is the fossa. This is the fossa. This is the scope inside the fossa. So you can see it's a perfect fossa. There is some water extravasation, you see, below the, the bladder because I did a bladder neck uh, perforation, but it doesn't seem too bad. Cambiar el transductor, por favor. This is the longitudinal view. Now, you see, we have done a perfect anatomical clearance of the adenoma. Okay. So we finish. Let's put a catheter. Thank you. Again, put a catheter. Usually, we use a three way catheter. We will leave some irrigation going on and we will tailor the speed of the irrigation to the need of the patient. No, no, so in this case, you see my nurse. I don't know if you're seeing this. Vale, it's going to help me make sure that the catheter goes in the right place. a poner 60 en el balón. Good. So the case was uh, slightly more difficult in the left side because I saw that tissue there, which was quite sticky. But at the end, uh, we managed to do these cases in a reasonable time frame. Normally under one hour. Come on. Except in very, very large uh, prostates. This was relatively large. Okay, and as I said, maybe in this case, we will leave the catheter one more day just in case. Although often when we see this kind of, you know, subtrigonal perforations, we take the catheter out, patients see very well. There might be some improvisation, but it's too clinical. So we will see tomorrow. So now I'm happy to take any questions. Maybe we could go to the, let me talk to the patient and tell him that everything was okay. Perdón, gracias. Todo bien, eh? ya hemos terminado. Ha ido todo fenomenal. Vale, venga, pues ala, a recuperarse. Santi, vienes, sí. El otro lado, ok. Ah, okay, okay. So let's come out here. I'll take my mask off. So I, I don't know how was the quality of the image. Could you see everything? Yeah, I saw, um, I think it was a very good presentation and uh, yeah, the image was, uh, yeah, only the, the minutes where it was uh, broke down yeah, 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 but I, I, I stopped at that time, so I, I didn't continue operating, so you could see the, the full, the full operation. Uh, does, sorry, does uh, Marek has also an uh, option to, to speak and uh, to talk? Marek Zawadzki? Because we Marek, have him, Marek, we have yes, him as, a, as a tutor. But he should, he should uh, activate his microphone. Mira a ver Santi si Marek puede hablar, sí. Okay. Hi, Marek. Because Octa maybe, maybe check, check if your microphone is can, can you hear me, Fernando? Yes, 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 I can hear you. Nice, nice to hear you again. Nice to, yes. nice to see you. Uh, Fernando, the, the, in the world, there is a trend that people trying to do the same enucleation with this small fiber dust or tulium fiber laser. What's your opinion about it? No, it's perfectly feasible. You know, I think the effect is a little bit different, but the surgeon can compensate for these differences. You know, if... But I find, I find that I am more relaxed if I'm using a holmium 
because I can rely more on, on these dissection effects, you know. So to me, the homium is like if I had a scissor opening, you know, when I, when I try to dissect the plane, the scissor is opening and it's helping me dissect this plane with the tulium fiber and with the uh, pulse tulium lasers. And uh, of course, with continuous wave tulium, the yes. idea is that the energy will cut very well, will coagulate really well, but it's like trying to peel the orange with a very uh, sharp knife, you know? It's, uh, it has a less uh, dissecting effect. But you have experience with that too, Marek. What is your opinion? I think personally that for the very well educated and the urologist in Holeb, uh, using tulium fiber is quite easy, as you mentioned. But for new beginners, it's rather difficult because the uh, bubble is so small that they have difficulty to find the correct plane and they are cutting through tissue. So for the new beginners, not probably not so good laser, in my opinion. I, I agree. I concur with you. Yes. Uh, you know, I think Holip is based on understanding the anatomy. So for people who have been doing uh, TRP, you know, during their lives, they never saw this plane the way we see it here. So yeah. if you understand the anatomy and you get some experience with the anatomy, then the tool is less relevant. Uh, and I have to say that tulium fiber and post tulium lasers provide even better hemostasis than homium, I think. Yeah, true. Which is an advantage on the other side. So if, if, you, if you know your anatomy and if you know, if you have experience, then these are very competitive lasers because you get good hemostasis, you get fast dissection and you can, you can uh, you know, perfectly use these lasers as well. Mm -hmm. My favorite, I have to say, is holmium, though, because of this dissection effect. And, but uh, maybe it's my favorite because I use it more, you know. But, but uh, when you use a laser a lot, you can compensate for the, for the differences in the, in, the, in the effect. Yeah, but, but in the world, really, the cost of holmium laser is much bigger and much higher than the tulium fiber laser. And people are thinking that they will buy tulium fiber and it will... Uh, be st uh, laser for stones, which probably this laser is a little bit better than holmium for soft stones, um, creating better dust, and we'll have the same laser for prostates. And I think this message is a little bit wrong. We cannot uh, compensate, we cannot replace holmium still with this tulium fiber laser. Yes, yes, of well, course. Just a second, we have to yes. move it. You have to move the, you have to move the, the bed. Good. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Of course, uh, homium still has a big, uh, big role, and uh, many, many experts like uh, Guido Giusti in Italy, for example, stone guys, tell you that uh, they they would never give away their homium. You know, yeah. they like tulium for particular cases. They like the dusting effect, but um, they, they wouldn't give you know, away the homium. You know? and, and I do prostate. I have tried all the lasers. I appreciate the perfect you know nearly perfect hemostasis from from tulium fiber and and uh, post tulium lasers but uh, i still would stick with with holmium you know for the majority of cases if, if, if you ask me what is your favorite i would go for for holmium too and the other question is about the prostate cancer and the risk of prostate cancer after what what's your opinion how how what will be the factor we should evaluate diagnosis of the uh, prostate cancer before enucleation? Should we perform enucleation in, in people with PIRATS3 in the uh, transitional zone, or should we go on the biopsy? What's your strategy? <laughs> well, this is a clinical judgment, uh, clinical judgment question, and this is what we do. Uh, we have to face uh, different cases every day. It depends on the age of the patient. It depends on the history of the patient. If the patient had a high PSA, but it was stable over, over the years, or if it's a rising PSA, you know, there are many factors. What we try to do is, if there is a suspicion of cancer, we, we try to rule it out. And mm -hmm. uh, is it a negative MRI enough? Uh, well, there will always be a risk of finding a cancer in a patient, but we have to reasonably uh, rule out these cancers. Recently, we are doing these uh, blood tests looking for circulating tumor cells. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the problem? No, no, no the camera we hits. Are we are cutting your head. Oh, okay. So we, we now have another tool that will, I'm sure, will get more and more popular, which is to be able to do this blood test that detects circulating cancer cells. And this is an additional, you know, non-aggressive uh, biopsy, uh, you know, CTC detection, uh, circulating tumor cells is helping yeah. us too with this with these patients. But uh, in, in the standard setting, I would say, if you have a high PSA and a normal MRI, probably the normal MRI rule out, rules out a very bad tumor. And if the patient you know, has a catheter or has a, an obstructive uh, condition, you know, and then you detect a cancer, this patient can still be treated by surgery or radiation therapy. So it's not, not the end of the world. So I would say rule out a cancer if you suspect it, but uh, reasonably, you know, rule it out. Some mm -hmm. cases they might have a normal MRI, but the PSA is rising and raising and it's very suspicious and then we might decide. So, so we would do what we usually do to rule out cancer. And if we are satisfied that there is no cancer, then we would do the, the, the enucleation. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the last question, what's the level or what's the threshold of PSA after enucleation which you are, makes you happy? Well, I, I have to say that uh, most of my patients have a PSA lower than one. Okay. I am quite aggressive, uh, as you have seen. If I doubt that there is yellow tissue, I take it out. If there are nodules, I take them out. If there are apical nodules near the sphincter, I take them out. You know, I'm very aggressive taking tissue out. And uh, I have to say most of the patients have BSA below one. Uh, we think uh, based on publications that other people have done that a PSA lower than 1.5 is, is normal. If it goes up from 1.5, we will start suspecting the possibility of, of a prostate cancer and then we would study the patient. So in the follow-up, and this is something that many, for example, GPs don't know, if you have a HOLEP, you know, you, I, I tend to put it in the reports. So I said to the GPs, you know, check the PSA. If it's more than 1.5, refer the patient back to us because there is a chance that gets higher and higher as it goes up from 1.5 to 2 to 3 that uh, this patient will have a prostate cancer. Um, and do, do you agree? Do you agree, Mark? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's my normal rule that I, I, I accept a level less than one. And if it's increasing or it's a little bit higher than one and going up, so I just perform MRI and trying to find if there is some lesion. So very often it's inflammation inside the peripheral zone. And sometimes it happens that there are appearing some nodules, which we hit with a biopsy. So that's everyday practice. Brilliant. So regarding the question of if, if there's no more questions from the floor, from the people watching this, uh, regarding the learning, and maybe you can give us your opinion as well, Marek. I think it is paramount to see many procedures. You know, I think it's a complex operation and you have to, to go to a center where they do a lot of procedures and see many, because when you understand the procedure, um, then the chances that you're going to be able to do it are much better. And I wouldn't recommend anybody to, to try to do HOLEP if they have seen two or three cases. It doesn't make sense. You, you should see 30 or 40. And then, of course, ideally, you should try to find a you know, collaboration, a mentor who can come and help you, much as, as we did with you, Marek. Uh, you, I think you saw many, many procedures before starting to do HOLEP. And then when you were ready, you could teach your colleagues. And uh, as I understand now, uh, in your team, everybody does follow at a very high level. No? Yeah, that's true. That's true. And we did, we did uh, in 2018, as you remember, this uh, concept of HOLEP in Poland, in, in my country, and uh, it went very, very well. And uh, we uh, we didn't stop by doing it by ourselves. We all shared the knowledge. And until now, in my country, there is something like 10, 15 people who can easily perform oh, enucleation. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, but I think, you know, you, you experience it when you have a constant uh, uh, agreement. And I say to people, you know, when you're going to budget the purchase of a laser and instruments, you shouldn't only budget the instruments and 
the the laser you should budget for training as well so you need yeah. to go to a center watch how they do and maybe you should save a little bit of money to, to have someone come and help you with your first cases and then revisit your technique when you have done 20 30 and this way you can you can you can make sure that the process is going to, to work well Yes, true. And the, the, what the people are lacking that they are they don't have a plan in the beginning. They don't have the strategy for for treating the prostate. So what is important to have always the plan, which will be the same in every operation, and they will follow it as a courses, and they will succeed. But that way, then of course there are other practical issues that we tend to discuss, but many times people do not know. So for example, if if you um, if you're going to do if you're going to start in your hospital with Holep, you should invite someone who can do a very good job and make sure that the session is successful. And, and follow me with this. If you, let's say, generate the attention, you know, from the hospital management, the anesthesia department, the nurses, everybody's watching you and you're doing your first case, your first case is going to take you a long time. And then the anesthetist will come in the, your ear and he will tell you, you could have done three TRPs at the same time as you did the first holip. Um, you know, then the manager will be not happy because he took too long. And then when he does his numbers, he thinks, okay, this guy is going to be able to do one or two cases in the morning or when he was able to do four or five, you know, TRPs. So if you want to start, if you want to kick off uh, in your department, you have to bring someone, you know, like Marek, who can do a very good job. Um, uh do a session with three four cases so that everybody is excited about it you know if you can do cases under one hour and the urine is clear when the patient comes out the operating room and the nurses in the in the in the hospital in the wards they see that uh the urines are clear they don't have to be so worried everybody is very happy and then when you do your first case everybody will understand that it will take you some time to get from what they see with you to what they saw, you know, in the first experience. So this is a clever way to, to start. Also, if you have to convince your hospital management, I think it's a bad idea to tell them, you know, I need, I don't know, 200,000 euros to buy a laser, to buy a morselator, to buy the equipment and to get trained, you know, because they will say no, <laughs> you know. Why should I spend this money? The way to, to approach it, I think, is to, to tell the manager, you know, can you picture how my department is going to change? How many more beds and how many more bed day, days we will get if we can discharge the patients in less than 24 hours, if we can do some cases ambulatorily, um, you know, and then when you start taking into account the change that the department is going to experience, you know, some departments still do open prostatectomy or laparoscopic or even robotic, you know, and, and if you tell them we could get rid of all this, you know, all the opens, all the TURPs, uh, in many centers doing TURP, the patient stays two or three days, you know, instead of one day, there's a rate of transfusion. In many centers, they prepare blood before the operation. So. When you start looking at all this, when you do the big business plan, when you when you see the big picture, then 200,000 euros or whatever you have to invest is not not too bad, you know. Sorry. <laughs> do you agree with me or is there any comments? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that was uh, in, in our hospital that we started it and we get the long time view in the future. So we, I told them that it will first last a little bit longer but at the end when we will pass the learning curve uh, comparing to trp will be much faster and the nurses will be much happier and it appeared it's everyday practice and uh, nobody can imagine uh, that we will come back to trp so even my residents and the new specialists they cannot perform trp in my hospital they can only perform enucleation on the prostate yes it is a cultural change and uh, it takes a little while. Some people are hard to convince. Uh, some people have to face, you know, to be out of their comfort zone, you know, because if you do TRP very well, you have to start from zero with, with Holep and it will take you some time to get, 
to the same level that you had, the level of competence that you had with TRP. But the change is amazing. And the ability to get rid, or to, to make your patients get rid of their problems, you know, their catheter, their infections, their uh, symptoms uh, is going to be paramount. What do you tell me, Marek, about the results? I mean, how happy are you with this uh, post-operative outcomes for patients compared to, to what you saw before? Um, the results are now that we, um, we, we adapted uh, the, your technique. We still are using your technique, maybe a little bit more modified, something between Felipe and, and, uh, and your technique. And, and we have only in some group of patients the, the, uh, two people someone, on the on someone the, has to close his microphone. There's some yeah, and, and we have only urge incontinence. The stress urinary incontinence is very, very seldom. And uh, we we in our hospital are doing something between 500 cases in a year. So everybody is doing this operation and the people are very open-minded coming from a whole uh, our the region, even geographic region. So the results are really good. What I not agree with some data and some publication that we were, were tried, we have tried to do some enucleation on the anticoagulants, but it was, I have bad experience with this and uh, it's uh, obligatory to stop to switch to heparin. Yes. And <laughs> so in these two patients, we had to uh, make a transfusion. They were these two patients who were on clopidogrel or xarelto or something like that. So we suddenly stopped and said, no, 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 that's not a good way. Yes. I think, uh, yeah, of course, companies, when they do marketing, they tend to be over enthusiastic. And for some reason, some surgeons are saying things that might be applicable, maybe in their centers with their level of experience. And they say, you know, I can do a fully anticoagulated patient with uh, Holip. And uh, okay, bye bye, bye bye, all the best. Uh, take care. So, I agree with you completely. I think anticoagulated patients, you know, when I was young, I saw, I had this experience of a patient phoning from home saying I'm bleeding in my urine and he was anticoagulated. So we send an ambulance and by the time he came to the hospital, he had him exsanguinated, he was dead. Yeah. So, you know, bleeding in an anticoagulated patient is very serious and we, we shouldn't underestimate the, this risk. We have had also some, some terrible cases where the patient bled and had to go to the operation theater more than one time, you know, and had uh, blood transfusions and nearly died because of, 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 of bleeding. So we try to compete to, to fight with the anesthetists and the internists who are very or always very worried about the medical complications. And they try to reestablish anticoagulation very fast. And we, we try to tell them, please let us keep the patient a little bit dry on anticoagulation for, 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 for some time. So if you, for example, use heparin, use heparin at reasonable doses, because with heparin at very high doses, patients bleed a lot as well, That's true. even That's true. after laser procedures. So uh, of course you have to tell the patients that he might expect to have long-term uh, mild hematuria. You know, the patients that do well, they have hematuria for a month and a half or something. I know that's your experience as well. Yeah, yes, so that's true. And the other level, it's low level, you know, they don't get anemia, but but you have to tell them, otherwise they're very stressed. And the other other um, problem which which you know, the people who are starting this operation may face is the longitudinal catheter. So we had up until five patients with septic complication afterwards. So I'm very uh, actively checking the um, urine culture before the operation. I'm sending the tip of the catheter before the operation or a week before the operation for the analysis for the urinary culture to check if there is no infection. And it's I, especially, yeah. I fully agree, you know, because one, one thing that happens when you do HOLEP is that you get to do more patients because there will be more patients looking for you and then 
instead of doing the normal numbers of TRPs that a center does, you know, you start getting more BPH patients because they look for you. And then, you know, if a complication happens in 1% of patients, in your case, if you do 500 cases, you will see it five times in a year. So, yeah, what I was trying to say is I agree completely. We are very anal. I experienced uh, two sepsis in my life with endoscopic procedures like this. And since then, despite the guidelines uh, do not recommend that, I started doing uh, cultures of the tip of the catheter. And uh, I give them at least four or five days of antibiotics if the culture is positive, which is usually positive in a catheterized patient, and we have zero sepsis. So I think it's a good advice. And I'm very glad to hear that you are doing the same because I think it's uh, what we have to recommend to, to people doing uh, endoscopic, uh, endoscopic procedures like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to be safe and then we will get more patients by doing correct work, correct job. Yes, definitely. The next patient is coming in uh, the operating room. So I hope in five, five, 10 minutes, we can start with the second case. The second case, uh, I think it's, I don't remember the characteristics, but there is a slide, I think. No, we have a slide. Let's see if we can see the slide. Nos puedes poner la diapositiva del segundo caso? No, están puestas. No, so let me see the case and I will tell you about it. So, es este, ¿no, Roberto? Okay, so this, this, uh, this man is a 59-year-old man, and he has uh, long-term symptoms in, uh, under uh, treatment with uh, dual darts, a combination of dutastrate and uh, and tamsulosin, and his PSA was a little bit high, and his prostate volume is about 80, 80, 90 grams as well, with a slow flow, five millimeters per second, five millimeters per second. And they're getting him ready. Let's go outside again yes. until he's ready. Sorry. So, Marek, are there any other questions from, from the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> there are many questions <laughs> about ahead, it. But let's, let's, move let, let's make this uh, discussion very uh, discussion live. Yeah, what, what are your recommendations for the people who are starting? What's the... What, which size of the can you, prostate... Can you say again? Yeah. Hmm? What I is the recommendation? Say, what's the recommendation to choose the best patient for as a first case? Oh, yes. I, I would say that uh, very small prostates are difficult because the plane is not very well developed and they're very difficult. I, I wouldn't recommend to start with 40 gram prostates and smaller. My recommendation would be to start with probably 50, 60. Mm -hmm. 50, 60, because if you have any trouble, if you have any trouble, uh, uh, you can manage the, the situation with a TRP. You can convert, you can get out of trouble. If, if you have to do initially a 120 gram prostate of course at the beginning you're a little bit slow with your dissection you know you have to check many times and uh, it will get uh, it will become very long you will get tired of course there is some stress at the beginning and if you're stressed you will be wasted you know so yeah. i think 60 grams 50 60 is, is the ideal yeah, my recommendation is that to teach people in groups so that two people will work, will have to be in the same level and one is doing a nucleation and after the first nucleation people are getting tired and more solution that the second person takes over and performs the more solution so they are switching with time and uh, also, I don't like, and I notice it in my uh, residents. They don't like strictures in the urethra because, in my because, in my opinion, the there is a little bit higher pressure inside the prostate. And the prostate is a little bit sticky, much more, and uh, they don't like the catheter patients. They don't like the stone patients, and uh, all the cases are more difficult for them. Yes, yes, that's uh, quite reasonable. Quite reasonable. Uh, so choose. But size of the prostate is the most determinant factor, I would say. Um, don't go very, very small and don't, don't go very, very big. Right? 
And mm. then, of course, if, if you can get a simple test without biopsies, without uh, infections, you know, without uh, all these things, then you will, you will, you will do much better. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So what's what's your what's your strategy still still why why can you can we still because I was I joined your operation at the end when you I, you were doing the morselation and why you think that M block is still the best Well I think I think the M block technique has many advantages the first one is that it's simple to understand uh, because it's like uh, you know peeling an orange circumferentially. You know, it's it's easier to understand. Uh, also, liberating the apex first, marking the mucosa, protecting the mucosa of the sphincter, has let's say revolutionized. I would say, a whole in the sense that, in some centers and some centers that have very honestly published their experience, like in Milan, uh, they they say you know we have 30, 40 percent of stress incontinence at the beginning using the classic technique. So this has now gone to nearly zero, I mean, you know, very, very rare. And if it's a stress incontinence that will be, it will be mild and not, uh, you know, not so, not, not a problem anymore really in, in our daily life. So the visibility of the field is amazing. The uh, speed of the procedure is amazing. I have seen people tell me, I, I take half of the time doing in block than when I did three lobe techniques. Um, so it's it's all advantages really. Of course, the initial part is, is the most difficult in my opinion, the, the liberation of the apex. But uh, I will try, if you, if you see the second procedure, I will try to show how I tackle progressively, you know, the apex and how I mobilize the apex. Uh, so it can, it can, it can be pushed down so you can see the 12 o'clock area and uh, and do a very very nice and very careful release of the sphincter at the beginning of the procedure mm -hmm. so many many advantages i remember when you learned uh, a block we went to the eau and you saw a video of a guy presenting a three lobe technique and you sent me a whatsapp message saying why is he doing it so difficult you know yeah so when you learn and block uh, uh and you see it uh the tree lobe technique looks uh also you know the visibility when you do an incision in the prostate there will be blood and this blood will go in the bladder and then it will be very difficult to wash it out so many times uh, when you see tree lobe techniques the, vi the visibility and the bleeding and that uh, of course uh, is not ideal with with uh, and block even when there is an artery pumping blood into this space the quality of the irrigation is so good that uh, it will wash out and you will continue. You will coagulate the vessel and you will continue to see perfect. Yeah, there are always, always people coming to our center uh, to, to see how we are doing coagulation, asking me if I can perform three lobe or two lobe technique. And I always ask them, should I know how to do it? Or is it well, enough no, with I, envelope? I have, I have to say, you know, occasionally, and it's very rare, but I remember one case of a, you know, like the, the thiasic uh, prostatitis uh, it was a prostate that was a bag of stones where I couldn't see very well. The stones were, you know, jumping from one place to the next and I couldn't do a classic uh, block. So I did a three lobe. So I think if you want to do three lobe, there are some principles that you can follow. And, uh, and uh, of course you should do the, the white line, you should mark the effects you should uh, look after the sphincter and probably the results of three lobe or two lobe or one lobe, you know, a block with one incision like Scofone published uh, is, yeah. is, is a good idea and you probably can, can reproduce the same or similar uh, continent results. So I think it's, it's nice to know, you know, I would probably mm -hmm. try in a favorable case. So you get acquainted with the different variations of the technique and then you're fully prepared to tackle any case yeah, yeah. i'm going to scrub but uh we will follow follow me well yeah. ya estamos donde está mi mascarilla mascarilla ah, la tengo. okay
So I'm very uh, proud of what you're doing in Poland, Marek, because uh, now a lot of people are able to do Horeb and, and they will teach other people. And this is like a stain of oil. Huh? Buenas tardes. Yeah. Vamos al ataque. Buenas tardes. Okay. Vamos allá. But it was all was your huge influence, Fernando. So that no, was no, your I'm job. Yeah. Very happy, especially when uh, when I hear, hear this news because uh, it's very nice that uh, you were very generous to to share the knowledge in your country and to popularize not only BPH but also endourology, you know, for stones. Yeah. Okay, so let's get ready. You can ask me questions if you want, but I will try to go through the steps of the technique again. Perfecto. Okay, so let's go inside. Let's see if we can see the endoscopic image. Do you have the endoscopic image? Yes, we have it. Now you can see the urethra, right? Mm -hmm. Can you? Yes, we we see it. Yes. Okay, there's some bubbles. I don't I don't like bubbles. I don't know why I have so many bubbles. Let me. Okay. So here we are approaching the apex. Typically, it's a little bit tight here in the membranous urethra, but. Here we are again. I like to enter slowly because I can see the shape of the sphincter right from the beginning, you see. Here we can see the limit between apex and adenoma. And just as the last case, you see the vertebrae is further inside. Huh? So here that probably is a cyst. That's the prostate. So it's again, relatively bulky case. And sometimes you have to push a lot if you want to see the UO. So I don't, I don't stress it too much because I could see them later, but they're close to the bladder neck. So we have to be careful. You can see it's a trabeculated bladder, but not too, not too bad. Okay, vamos con la fibra. So I'm going to introduce the fiber. Good. So. Here we are again, Veru, and here is the line. You see, I'm going to mark the limits of the dissection. This is the white line, white line, but we'll try to make sure that the mucosa doesn't break uh, due to traction, but we will break it uh, where we want, you see. And uh, here, if I come out, this is the sphincter, so we're quite safe. Huh? Sometimes there will be uh, a little bit of bleeding, you see that the mucosa is very uh, well vascularized. But if, if you cannot see very well, my advice is to go in the plane very fast. So here you can see the, the floor of the Vero Montanum here, you see. So here I'm going to come and I'm going to try to enter the plane. Let's see. Enter the plane. I have lost uh, respect for this step of the operation. You know, I, I don't hesitate too much you know i just go to the floor and i move laterally and i try to understand how uh steep is is the the this plane you see in the bigger prostates it tends to be more vertical in the smaller prostates it tends to be more horizontal here this is the apical side of my white line and here i will come to the to the floor of the veru again you see and i will try to enter again With these movements from side to side, you see here, I think the scope probably helps a little bit as well, but it's a fast entry into the plane initially in one side and then on another side. Then of course, when you have progressed a little bit, you can see that you have two spaces, huh? one space, the other space, and now we cut in the midline. It's similar to what we will do at 12 o'clock, but in an opposite, uh, manner uh, when we want to release the sphincter anteriorly. 
So we come from both sides and we leave it uh, for the end. Here, what I'm trying to do now, and as I explain later, I try to position my scope so that half of the screen is uh, with Adnoma and half of the screen is with Capsule. And uh, you see the line is in the middle. And now I'm, I'm keeping my scope. You see, I don't work with the fiber like that. You see, I don't work like that very far away because when I put my scope closer to the, to the plane, there is some traction and counter traction, you see, on the plane. So keeping the endoscope close to the tissue and keeping the fiber close to the endoscope gives me some advantage in terms of uh, dissection. I'm not dissecting the plane mechanically. This is dissecting the plane mechanically. When I go in and push, you see, this is dissection with mechanical effort. I don't do that. I just contact, I just keep close. But you see by keeping close, when I get closer, you see there is some traction. There is a little bit of traction and then it is the laser energy that does the dissection. It's a very subtle, it's a very subtle thing, but it's very important, I think, to, to help you carry out the dissection. As I said, instead of going very deep in one place like this, I go from side to side. I do very wide movements because wide movements allow me to have a uniform line. You see, and we were discussing before that the settings of the laser, and maybe Marek, you didn't see that, Mm -hmm. Settings are important, but they're not the only factor that con the determine tissue uh, laser interaction. So there is one factor that is very important or factor number two, because if the first factor is the settings, factor number two would be working distance. If mm -hmm. I fire far from the tissue, nothing happens. If I fire too close, I will make a hole, you see. If, if I choose the right distance, I will get some dissection effect that is soft and nice. And the Fernando, you, st you, you still have the settings two joules to 50 yes, hertz, yes. yes? Yeah, yeah, these are my all lifetime settings. But mm -hmm. you, you see, because I think that the settings are not so relevant, uh, let's say, uh, not, not the only determinants, you know. Oh, yeah, Working yeah. distance, as I said, is number factor number two. Factor number three is going to be the speed of movement. You see, I'm moving my fiber from side to side. If I move very slowly like this, you see, I will maximize hemostatic effect. So I will have very good hemostasis. But if I move a little bit faster, I will maximize the dissection effects. You see, I will move forward uh, faster. So it's up to the surgeon to decide what speed of movement he has to take, he has to follow. But it's important, huh? two different surgeons using slightly different distances and slightly different speeds of dissection will have will do a totally different procedure, even when the, the wavelength and the uh, settings are the same. Okay, so I did a little bit of posterior dissection here. The, the fourth factor, I think, and it's one of the most important factors is where do you fire the laser related to the line of dissection. You can see this is my line, you see? I could fire against the line like this. I could fire outside of the line, so against the capsule, which is usually a bad idea. And I could fire closer to the adnoma, you see? This is what I call the aiming. And aiming is paramount because here, for example, there's some depths in the capsule. So I have to aim a little bit closer to the adnoma to correct, you see? And this is how we do this operation by conjugating not only the settings because settings automatically you know are not going to define what's going to happen in the operation which is the way you handle these settings okay but this we said before so i wanted to stress that again uh, with you marek so now i'm going to start the uh, anterior dissection this is my white line so initially i will cut to deepen the incision a little bit. This reminds me of when I used to do as a resident frayer operations. Uh, have you done frayer operations? Yes, yes, right. but it was okay. so a long open, time ago, long time you ago. You open the bladder and the first thing you do when you, when you see the middle lobe and the U, UOs is you do a cut on the mucosa. Mm -hmm. And then you cut the submucosa because you want to reach the proper plane. So here at the apex is the same. You have to cut a little bit deeper to reach the, the, the initiation of the plane. Now I am starting to develop the lateral plane. 
here you see that I'm going to take my dissection a little bit deeper into the into the in the direction of the bladder neck, and this is what I call the mobilize unconnect phase. Here, what I'm doing is I'm mobilizing the apex. This apex was attached here, and now I'm releasing it. So when I look up, you see I have some more information. I have better access. Here, yes. this is the line anteriorly. So here. The incision, the access incision becomes more horizontal. You see here. Mm -hmm. There we are. And then I will continue my dissection, but looking at the proper plane. You see here. <clears throat> and why don't I go further up deeper in my dissection? Because there is some apical tissue still here. If I try to go up, I will tear, I will break this fiber. So I'd rather cut them first, you see. If you cut the apical fibers first, then you can continue dissecting the plane. And then of course, don't stay very close to the sphincter. Just go a little bit inside because you need some mobility. <laughs> you need some mobilization of the apex to be able to reach the anterior part. And Fernando, some people say that uh, on the up, uh, anterior part of the prostate, there is no layer. Are you agree or not? No, no, there's a perfect plane usually. Yeah. Huh? You can see a perfect plane. You know, when I saw this very well, when I was doing green light in Ukraine, <coughs> there's a fantastic plane. But of course, uh, as I said before also, you know, the plane, the beautiful plane that you can see sometimes is not visible in all cases. And it's not visible in all the parts of the prostate in all the cases, you know what I mean? Sometimes you could see a very nice <coughs> posterior plane and then in that same patient, maybe the anterior plane is not so patent. And the other mm -hmm. way around, sometimes you don't see a very good posterior plane and you see an excellent anterior plane. So, but that's why you have to start recognizing the plane, not because it's beautiful, especially with these lasers that coagulate so much and so good, you know, like Julium fiber and, and so on. If you have uh, a view of the beautiful plane, when you fire the laser, it's going to coagulate. It gets white, so you don't you no longer see the plane. <laughs> I mean, you see the plane, but not very beautiful like before. So you see here, I am mobilizing the lateral aspect and also a little bit the anterior aspect because when we go to cut the twelve o'clock fibers later, we will have a very nice idea of where things are going. Let's go to the other side. I will deepen the incision again. This is like in the frayer operation. You need to go slightly deeper until you get uh, more exposure. Of course, I do it in the white line. I don't mind cutting a little bit on the adenoma because here I'm going to look for the lateral plane. Initially, the first, let's say, dissection is going to be only four or five millimeters like this because we will enter in the lateral plane. So this is the mobilize and connect phase, which means that I'm going to connect my line with the posterior line here. You see here, I'm doing lateral plane, but I'm connecting with the posterior line because I want to have a line that I can follow. You see, if I continue here, I connect lateral and posterior plane. Here we had the line that we did before. You see, I can follow that line. And I could go even to the other side and come up to the lateral plane, you see, because we, we need to set the landmarks and we need to set the reference so that the procedure is easy. Of course, I don't want to go up, up, up like this because we still have apical attachments. So I come out, this is my white line and I'm going to incise again because we want to have these access incisions. And then I'm going to try to go and look for the good plane here, you see, look where my incision was made here and look where I'm going. Huh? So I don't mind cutting a little bit for access and then look for the good plane, okay? And then again, I will gain four or five millimeters again, and I will take this dissection towards the bladder neck because I want to mobilize the apex. There we are. Always you have to judge if the plane is correct or not. Not only by, beauty, by, see, by seeing, <coughs> sorry, the beautiful plane, but also because we are able to distinguish some other characteristics. The capsule is more white. This is a little bit yellow, you see? So if you suspect that there is some yellow tissue, you can go deeper and try to take this tissue out and to correct your plane. 
also the the capsule is quite fibrous it's quite uh how do you say that uniform so we should see a relatively uniform plane not bumpy not with um bread like bread like uh, appearance which is typical of, of of bph so here i'm trying to develop the lateral plane but again i come out to check you see here there's i could go further up with my liberation so i go a little bit further up following my line and following my plane if i see that you see here for example it looks a little bit deep so i don't want to fire there i had to aim my laser closer to the anoma to correct the plane you see and when you do this with very long lines like i do i go up and down i don't do pits i don't do holes you know i, I just try to keep a very wide line of dissection it's quite easy to to understand what's going on it's quite easy to judge what we are doing you get good orientation and now we are coming you see uh, a little bit more here for example it, it looks like a nodule you see it's a little bit yellow so we have to correct the plane again we want to take the nodules out huh? this happens as i say in the best family so if you see that there is a residual anoma it's, it's nicer to go in and, and try to take it out so here now we are getting towards uh, 12 o'clock so i'll do another let's say 12 o'clock more closer to the 12 o'clock uh, incision for access and then i will try to to see if i can understand this plane that we saw here sometimes we get so close to the tissue i'm going to try to focus a little bit closer if i can and then of course when things get a little bit tricky or difficult just relax try to make uh, small advancements you know small improvements sorry i broke the fiber in my hand this is not common but sometimes it can happen i don't know why there we are this is fiber again coming in so i have no pressure with my water okay uh, Fernando, Here, what? I was I was climbing towards twelve o'clock. Yes. Uh, let's discuss the instruments. I don't know if you have mentioned in the first part of your presentation uh, the yes, tip yes. of the in instrument. Is it important to find to follow the correctly the plane, or the, every well, instruments are are good, or some are better? What, what's well, your opinion? I, I, I used to work with uh, Richard Wolf instruments, and what I like from them is that. The tip is very uh, not aggressive, huh? so it's not pointy. And also the lens is a little bit inside the tip. So Perspective. See, even when I touch the tissue, now I'm touching the tissue, I can see what's happening. Mm -hmm. With uh, storts, for example, uh, you get a situation where, you see, these are nodules. Huh? We want to take these nodules out. So I, I need to, to go further up here. So uh, I, I prefer these instruments because of this particular uh, situation. When you touch the tissue with a stored instrument, for example, you don't see very well because the lens is going all the way out to the surface or the external part of the tip, you know, and uh, so the tissue is going to block the, the view. Okay, so now what I'm going to try to show you, and we can continue on that. You see, this is this side, we did this dissection, the apex fell a little bit you see the touching it from the anterior allows the apex to fall down and here in this side we have the same picture you see we have this plane and now in between we have the 12 o'clock fiber so now it becomes very easy to cut these fibers you see because we have perfect orientation so it's similar to what we did near the veru we open the space in one side we open the space on the on the other side and then we connect in the middle by cutting the frenulum. So here you see that we are trying to go and look for the uppermost uh, plane. I don't see very well. Let's see if I can focus better. Yeah. And then I will try to construct 
the anterior line. You know, the anterior line takes more effort to construct. Here you see, I see a nice, nice round line. Here I see that if I follow downwards, you know, I should see, let's see where we are. This is still a little bit of a noma. So I should construct this line <laughs> until I can follow the line uh, around the prostate. Huh? You see, the thing is that here there's some nodules anteriorly on this side, and I'm going to try to take them with the anoma. So yes, but uh, I haven't tried other instruments, you know, for a long time. So I think um, there's a very nice uh, surgeons doing surgery with different instruments. So I don't know, what is your experience, Marek, with different instruments? What do you like? I really like the uh, Wolf, and I also tried many times the um, Milep. Uh, Fernand, Philippe uh, um, introduced yeah, yeah, this yeah. 22.5 uh, endoscope, and it has a little bit uh, steeper uh, tip of the endoscope, but it can enucleate very well. Too. I, I really don't like Storz and I hate Olympus. I don't know why, <laughs> but I hate Olympus. <laughs> I, not company, but tip of the end. Of course, yeah, yeah, the instruments, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, you have to find what works uh, well for you. Now you see we have constructed a nice anterior line that we can follow. So I'm going to try to see if I can connect uh, this line with, with the lateral line. You see this is lateral line. Now this is more anterior, more anterior. And uh, you see now the operation becomes a piece of cake because we have a nice line that goes around the anoma and our only concern is to check or to, to check the quality of the plane. You know, if the plane is, you see that here, if the plane is very good, we just have to follow the line and we have to concentrate where do we aim the laser you know if you see as we as we progress in the operation the initially the angles of the planes are opening and now they're going to close you see now for example so initially the the anterior was going up and now here the anterior plane is going down you see so in order to adapt to the curves for example, in the lateral in the lateral aspect here, initially the plane was going out, but as we get here, the plane is going in now. You know, it's it's because we are dissecting a pseudo spheric uh, structure. No, yeah. so the idea is that you have to change your aiming uh, to adapt for these changes in angulation. Initially, always, working always... against the line is 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 absolutely okay. But as, as the change, as the angles of the plane change, you have to change your aiming and you have to do like a motorbike driver, you know? When a motorbike driver wants to take a curve, what does he do? He tilts towards the curve, you know? And here we have to tilt towards the curve as well. So the fiber has to get closer to the, to the, to the tissue or to the adenoma so we can continue with our dissection but you see we have excellent visibility we have excellent orientation we're just going around following this plane and judging you know if i go very deep i have to point my laser a little bit closer to the anoma if i see a nodule i have to point outside of the line because we want to take the nodule you know as we did before but also i do these movements you know that are long movements careful movements and if you think about it, if we are trying to take the right or to, to use the right working distance with the tissue, and you have a very uniform line, it's very easy to move around and keep the right distance to the tissue because the line is uniform. You know what I mean? I don't have to go up, in and out to, to adapt for a very irregular line. <laughs> so if you can construct the lines and you can follow the lines and you can make them uniform, then the procedure is greatly simplified.
Fernando, let's discuss the minimum energy, minimum minimum laser voltage. Uh, people yes. can start inoculation with. Uh, if, is is sixty watt laser enough, or it should be one hundred or one fifty? What's your opinion? Well, you can work with low power. You can work with low power. Fifty watts is enough, I think. And mm -hmm. uh, usually, in many, let's say, fifty watts lasers, you cannot work with more than 40 36 watts of energy you know yep. because they cannot withstand the continuous lasing time like this no you see that most of the operating time happens with the activated laser this is why the procedure is so fast because there's very little pausing time so you can work and i have worked with low power for 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 a long time in in bulgaria and uh, i have to say i hate it you know because i don't think it is uh, relevant for the patients but it is certainly relevant for the for the for the surgeon you know if you have uh higher uh, the ability of having you know two joules and maybe a higher frequency the quality of hemostasis will be better the quality of the dissection will be better so I think you can, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it for a center that is going to do a lot of cases because hemostasis probably is more difficult to keep. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I struggle a lot with low power and I don't think there is a you know, clear advantage or let's say demonstrated advantage to low power. I mm -hmm. think patients, uh, I don't believe that they do better than using high power and, and i will give you an argument you see i'm trying to do a very efficient use of energy you know i if i am a very good surgeon i can uh, choose the right distance to the tissue you know i i have a nice effect that gives me good coagulation i'm a fast surgeon but then a slow surgeon could be taking a long time in the same spot you know to get good mm -hmm. hemostasis to coagulate. So two different surgeons could use a, a, a hugely different amounts of energy. So sometimes, you know, I am convinced that I am using a high, uh, high laser, high power laser, you know, but maybe the amount of energy I use is not so high because it's, it's a very efficient use of energy, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. a, a beginner will have a low power laser and he will have to go several times over the same position. He will have to stay uh, longer. He will have to move faster, you know? So maybe at the end, the amount of energy that the tissue receives is not radically different, you know? I understand. And my, my setting has evolved a little bit since we started the operation. And uh, I was at the first two years using the two joules, 50 Hertz. Then yes. I went a little bit down with the energy until 1.5, 60. And oh. now in the last uh, one or one and a half year, I'm using 1.270 with virtual basket. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I feel comfortable with the settings. Well, yes, everybody can choose, you know, their preferred uh, settings. Uh, depending on what you you know value most, I I like the the two joules because they give me a nice push, mm -hmm. a nice peak power that uh, will produce a nice bubble and a nice dissection effect. Maybe in terms of hemostasis, I don't know. With virtual basket, really, it's 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 a big change for the better. No, yes. now hemostasis is is really really good, huh? Yeah, so, I find the virtual basket is a must. I cannot uh, treat yeah, well yeah, the yeah. prostate it's without. It's a step forward. It's a step forward. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, we have now published uh, a paper recently with pulse modulation compared to the classic laser, and we can prove that pulse modulation uh, has advantages in terms of operating time. You have to yeah. spend less time doing hemostasis. You know, so it, it really it really helps. Huh? It really helps. It's a game changer, the modulation of the pulse. So here, what I'm doing now, you see that I, I, entered, I entered the bladder here. I'm coming down, I'm connecting the lines, you know, always trying to follow my lines and trying to connect my lines, trying to get, uh, you see. Also, I have to say that there's no fixed rules for Holeb. I think 
when you listen to me, when you listen to Marek, when you listen to Scofone, when you listen, you have to, let's say, of course, listen, try to understand why surgeons say certain things and try to, to, to validate that with your own experience. You know, I think many times we say slightly different things. We have different opinions. You know, it's, it's just uh, expert opinion. It's not uh, proper science. You know, the level of evidence of expert opinion is the lowest level of evidence available in medicine, you know? So uh, I think it's important that you make your own mind, you know, and you decide what works bet better for you. The same way that two surgeons would never do the same TORP, you know? TORP was made, was used by everybody, but, you know, everybody was doing something slightly different based on his experience, his, his ideas, his preferences. There are general principles, but then, of course, uh, it's like the no-touch technique, you know, no-touch, of course, when you, know, when you fire the laser from the distance and you let the laser do its effect, it's very nice. But sometimes when you do a lot of cases and you have experience, you find certain fibrous areas where you want to move faster and then you do a little bit of contact, you know. It's not the end of the world, you know what I mean? It's not... Uh, this is already dissected here. I'm going to the posterior aspect. And here, of course, is where the aiming gets very important. You see that the plane is a little bit flimsy. It's a little bit thin. So I need to keep my fiber uh, close to the upper side, close to the anoma, like the motorbike driver, you know, taking the curve. I need to tilt towards the anoma and see if I can progress in this plane without uh, deepening in the capsule you see the capsule is very thin so i keep my laser up i don't fire here i fire up there you see that will disrupt the fibers that are joining the anoma and the capsule but uh, i will try not to penetrate in the capsule and this is almost uh, finished now i need to check the position of the uos which was quite close but now i am in the posterior aspect going towards the bladder neck also following, following the line. So low power, no, thank you, huh? in, my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I tell to people, you know, if you start doing Holep, of course, low power laser is cheaper, but I would invest the money, you know, I would spend the money because if you do Holep, you will have many patients. And if you have many patients, you will need to work in good conditions. You will need to work fast. That's our UO. And we are now uh, medial to it, so it's, it's quite safe now. So my advice is always try to get the best equipment you cannot afford, you know? Not, not the one you can afford. You, you have to buy the one you cannot afford because at the end of the day, if you plan to have a certain number of patients, you will have more, you know, because Holep uh, brings you a lot of patients. They tell... You know, you operate a patient, you send him home and he tells his neighbor, uh, you know, I was operated yesterday. What? You are already at home, you know? My cousin needed to stay in the hospital for a week, you know? And, and then you will get a lot of patients. They will come here, for example, you see, this is a little bit deep. It's not outside, but I'm going to keep the fiber up here. You see, this way I can correct the plane. I can make sure but I, I don't go deeper than that. So this is how you can uh, conduct a HOLEP quite safely, huh? by understanding the, the laser tissue effects. Here, again, it's a little bit on the deep side, so I will keep close to the anoma, trying to release everything. So, yeah, yeah buy this, the this expensive stuff. equipment. Yeah, and if you can uh, uh, get your hands on a 150, what laser, I would say that despite you can perfectly work with uh, the 100 watt laser, I would say that 150 gives you a better, better solution. For one, and, and this is the best thing that I love from the laser from Quanta, it's a very silent laser. Huh? It doesn't make a lot of noise. Some low power lasers are like airplanes in the operating room, you know, they are so loud. If you have to stay many hours a week 
you know, operating with a laser, you, you want the laser to be quite, quite silent. Okay, here again, I'm going to show you what I do to tilt the prostate. This is the, the lobe. I'm going to lift it a little bit. So when I push it, it's not against the bladder neck. Huh? So here I will push a little bit and now the lobe has tilted. This is the prostatic urethra. This is the bladder neck. So now this lobe is in the bladder. And when I come below, to check for this side, I can see much better what's going on. You see there was some <coughs> a little attachment here. So I can do a better dissection now. And then, uh, as I said before, many people think that with a block, you cannot push the anoma in the bladder. So what I do, and this allows me to do a block in, in huge glands also, huh? not only the, the smaller ones. Let's see if this is uh, free or mostly free. So instead of pushing this lobe in that direction, I will push, I will push the lobe in this direction, you see? So trying to uh, make sure that the adenoma goes into the bladder uh, on the side, you know, on a rotational movement. So I started the rotation by pushing this lobe and I continue the rotation by pushing in this direction so that the adenoma rotates, you know, it's like the, the head of a fetus going through the birth canal. Huh? This is the same, same idea, a little bit poetic. And if, if Fernando, if the, the adenoma is too big to go inside the bladder to, so well, what's your recommendation? Do you cut well, at six? If, if that happens, then it would be very easy to go, now, now no, because it's rotated, but it, it's very easy to split it in two. Huh? Yeah. So you go to the prostatic urethra and you can very fast cut it in two. And then of course, and, or you could do, if you can make sure that there is no attachment here, even when the adenoma is inside the, the, the fossa, you could try to do intracapsular morselation. But for that, you must be absolutely sure that there's no attachment to the bladder neck. Right? And here we are finishing. You can see this side. We can see this UO probably around here somewhere. Now we saw it before here. And now we can see this side and we can see the UO here. So let's finish the nucleation. So you see, it's a very relaxed operation. You don't have to be stressed. You progress uh, according to a plan. You try to preserve the mucosa of the sphincter as best as you can. Uh, sometimes when you look back, and I, I will look back now to show you the sphincter, we see a perfectly preserved sphincter. Sometimes we see it's a little bit shattered or ischemic because of the movements in the operation. But if you follow these steps, even when you see that the sphincter is a little bit shattered at the end, endoscopically, the functional result is excellent. So let's see what we see when I come out. You see, I come out and I see the sphincter a little bit shattered by the movements, the ischemia, but the mucosa is on the sphincter. There's still mucosa. Huh? So that will guarantee that the patient will be continent, uh, perfectly continent. We can check hemostasis at the end to check that there's no bleeding. And more than the fossa, which is important, of course, I would check the, uh, the mucosa here. You see, uh, we, we, we discussed that this laser has an explosive effect. And it's very good to dissect the plane, but it's not so good as a cutting tool. Huh? So here, instead of doing a clean cut and coagulate the edges, it, it disrupts the mucosa. And often you have to spend the last minutes of the coagulation phase paying attention to the, to the mucosa because it tends to bleed. And here is where you can find the trouble later on when you do your morselation. If you're not careful doing this final hemostatic, you know, then you can have trouble. So let's go anteriorly and check. See, we have a nice fossa, nice sphincter. Let's do the ultrasound now because before we did it at the end, tenemos la ecografía. Can we change, podemos cambiar la imagen? This is a, look, this is a nodule that I left. You see, I tried to dissect it, but I couldn't, 
so now it's the trimming phase. Eh? I can go back, of course, and make sure that I can remove this little nodular aspect. It would perfectly show up if you do an ultrasound. This is quite nice. It will show up very nicely. Ah, there it is. Okay. Vamos a hacer la ecografía. Tenemos que cambiar a la imagen exterior para poder filmar. So what I'm doing is I'm introducing the, the ultrasound. You see? Now you can see the quality of the anatomical enucleation. You see that? So this is transrectal ultrasound. I have the scope in the in the fossa here. And you can see that we did a nice job. Tell me, about Now we will see the longitudinal view here, and you can see perfectly as well that uh, the anatomical job was very good. There we go. And now we will uh, switch to morselation. Let's do the final check. These bleeders are the ones that can bother you a lot with uh, morselation if you don't spend the time to, to coagulate. So Marek, is there any other question or aspect you want to cover? Yeah, the, let's discuss the two complications which can happen. First is the, string, the stricture of the urethra and yes. the second is bladder neck uh, stricture. How to avoid it? Well, the first, uh, the first idea is that if you do a fast operation, the stress on the urethra will be less. And if you do a gentle operation, of course, we will stress the urethra less. I think if I like very much the Otis urethrotomy, mm -hmm. I don't do it systematically, but if I notice some you know, uh, difficulty entering with the scope, I do an Otis uh, urethrotomy, a very mild, very gentle Otis, because I think that reduces the chance of uh, ischemia uh, you know, uh, of the urethra during the operation and posterior uh, stricture. So, of course, uh, Felipe has this concept that if you use a smaller instrument, you have uh, probably less risk of strictures, which is a nice concept, uh, which is not proven still. No, there's mm -hmm. no evidence uh, apart from his personal experience. Uh, but it, it would make sense, no, for the majority of us that if you use a lower caliber scope, especially if you find a stricture urethra, uh, it, it makes sense that uh, the risk might be less. Of course, uh, we see sometimes membranous urethral strictures that are very soft. And in these patients postoperatively, I recommend them to do self-dilatation with uh, low friction catheters. So they do it initially very often, and then they do it less and less often as they get better. And I have to say, most of the times after six months, they can stop uh, dilating the urethra and uh, they remain stable. I have a lot of patients like that. Of course, if you see a bad stricture, then it's less likely that uh, dilatation will help. And then, of course, you have to treat it as you would treat any stricture. Now, lately, we are using the Optilium balloon, and we are quite positive with the results we are getting because it's a simple balloon dilatation with uh, paclitaxel that impregnates the stricture uh, tissue and uh, apparently prevents it from stricturing again. So yeah. this, is, this is a comment. Regarding bladder neck, I don't know how to prevent it. I don't know if it is a matter of uh, um, perforation, perforation yeah. but I see horrible perforations which do not uh, you know, not horrible. Uh, what I'm, I'm saying is sometimes you, you go very deep, you fear that there will be a stricture and then there's no stricture. And sometimes you get a stricture in someone you wouldn't expect. Uh, so I, I don't think we know what is the, 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 the factor that uh, predisposes for, for bladder neck strictures. What we do no, with them is uh, we, we tell the patient that this is a relatively uh, benign complication and we do under sedation, we do a Mercedes star incision and we inject trimcinolone in the incisions. And we, I have to say with very good results, it's very unlikely that this will recur again. 
Yeah, my, my impression is also that uh, after TRP, when we are doing TRP, the strictures of the bladder neck recurred very quickly. But after laser operation, when you incise it, uh, like you mentioned with Mercedes star, it will probably not appear again. Yes, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's surprisingly, let's say, easy to 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 to, to, to solve. Well, yeah. I remember in my life a couple of cases where the stricture recurred and recurred and recurred, but uh, you know, so the, the frequency of uh, strictures that will recur is is very 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 mild, very slow, very minimal. I, I mean. And Thomas Herman has uh, some hypothesis on, on this, on the stricture that the bladder is weak and in patients with weak bladder, the maybe the stricture of the bladder neck can happen more frequently. Yeah, there's no data that I know of about that. So it's, it's probably an opinion, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, Thomas Herman is also pr proposing to leave a little flap yes. of glucose at 12 o'clock but uh, I discussed with Felipe recently, you know, because he was very, very um, publishing a lot uh, in Twitter saying in the small prostates, I leave at 12 o'clock, mucosal street, blah, blah, blah. And when I asked him, he said, no, I don't do it anymore because these patients tend to bleed a lot afterwards. Yeah. So I think these are hypotheses and not, that's what I say, you know, you shouldn't listen to the experts believing that everything they say is true because many times it's it's their opinion and their opinion is not is not science huh? mm -hmm. we should make a study uh, together yes, yes. in the center and find the, the factors which can influence this yes but uh, you know the variability of what we do is so much you know for some guys holep is a three hour operation they do three lobe you know yeah. They go with a resectoscope and they coagulate a lot at the end. So, you know, if you want to, to come to a conclusion in such a, a question, you know, it's very difficult to account for all the factors involved, you know. Uh, Holep, more or less, we have the same concept, but the practical application of Holep varies a lot from center to center. And uh, I don't know if, if, if we could find an answer easily you know, to, this, to this. Of course, we mm -hmm. know for, for scarring problems, you know, like keloid scars, that some people produce different kinds of collagen. And this is genetically determined. So probably some guys have more, you know, probability of developing scar, scar tissue that tends to retract. Uh, and other guys might not have that kind of collagen, you know. So there's probably some uh, risk factors that are related to the patient, not only the surgeon or the surgery. What I really think is that if you looked inside uh, in every patient, we would see a lot of subclinical bladder neck strictures. You know, I have often gone in with many patients, they have a, a not a stenosis, but a very close you know, bladder neck, it closes like a photographic camera diaphragm, and maybe the caliber is 30 French, and they have incredible flows, you know? They are so happy, but still they have some degree of uh, bladder neck contracture. Yeah, so because it, uh, they, have, they have a mysterious. strong bladder. Yeah, yeah, maybe they have a strong bladder, but happy patients with a relatively closed bladder neck, and then very unhappy patients with even bigger you know, bladder next, I don't know. In general, I would say that most uh, Holep patients are happy. The rate of stricture of the bladder neck and the rate of stricture of the urethra is quite low. So, you know, so for example, if, if you do a Holep with a minimal caliber instrument like uh, Felipe is proposing, but it takes you three hours, is this more aggressive than doing a Holep in half an hour with a bigger caliber scope, you know, we don't know, we don't know. Yeah. So this is the end for me. I, I don't check again, you know, what happens is that uh, during morselation, the irrigation power is not so good. So at the end, when we finish morselation, there's always, always a little bit of blood in the, in the fossa. But if we were able to morselate properly, usually I don't go back to check again. 
So this is it. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very Other, much. More, more questions? Are you on the last one, the first Ludger, do you have any questions? Or? Uh, from my side, uh, no, it was a um, very interesting evening. So um, for me personally, I learned a lot. And uh, I hope also all the attendees uh, could get something and good uh, new spirit for uh, Hulep. Uh, maybe one question regarding uh, training. Makes it sense uh, to do training also on, on a kind of model or is it um, uh, not so interesting? In simulators or models. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I, model. Yeah. I think it's it's a good idea before you start uh, your case, your initial case, you know. I think more uh, simulators can give you some clues about how to fold the scope. And also they give an opportunity for let's say the teacher to explain how to handle the fiber, how to handle the, the scope and everything. But I don't think when you have done some cases that keeping using the simulator will help you further. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, as, as a, an activity for people who are starting to do volleyball, who are going to start, it's probably OK, maybe for some hours. But then after that, the benefit would be very, very limited. I don't yeah. know what you think, Marek. Yeah, I think that uh, they help uh, people to play with the energy. But this operation is not only to see, it's, on, it's also to feel. And I, I always tell the resident that it's 80% seeing and 20% touching. And yes. the touch we cannot replace by the simulator on any model, models. Okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. So Thank you very I, much. I hope, I hope you have enjoyed the session and uh, it was very nice to, to talk to you, Marek, again. Thank you very much. After for the me. pandemic and everything. And uh, I'm very grateful and very happy that uh, things in Poland are evolving and you're a protagonist for that. And I don't know, as a final remark, I would say that if you're not doing Holep, this is something worth learning. Spend the time, watch a lot of videos. There's more and more videos online. Uh, look at them with a critic eye, but you will learn from different surgeons, different tips, and uh, try to get a nice uh, mentor if you can. Try to do as uh, Marek and I did. I was visiting him for 10 consecutive months, doing the difficult cases where they were doing the easy cases until they told me, you know, we can do every case. So I think it's, it's a good idea. And... Uh, I would like to thank uh, Cook for their sponsorship for this session and their, you know, continued support. And uh, I don't know if any one of you want to contact me and uh, come and visit us, we will try to accommodate your requests. And uh, I hope um, uh, whoever is learning will find uh, the same enthusiasm and will have the same generosity as uh, Marek to, to share with, with other colleagues from their countries. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the thank last uh, warm words and uh, have a very good weekend. And uh, I think we see us again in uh, Torino in two weeks. Yeah. I won't be there uh, uh, personally, but I will connect for one of the sessions. Ah, okay. So Sorry. in any case, we can always talk. Huh? Yeah. Thank you very, thank much. very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Also, thank you very much. We still have more, much, one Luther. more case, but uh, we will stop now and uh, maybe relax for a little while. Thank you for your attention and uh, all the best to all. Yeah, all thank the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.